Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. My name is Sabrina Paganoni, and I am a, a physician investigator. And my work, uh, both in the clinic and as part of my research projects, is all on ALS. Today, we're going to talk about how to get ahead of the ALS curve through early detection and intervention. And for now, we're going to focus on how we can enable earlier diagnosis of ALS. These are my disclosures. We're going to review how to evaluate the factors that can inform an early and accurate diagnosis of ALS. ALS is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease from Lou Gehrig, who developed the disease and is still very much um, you know, in everyone's mind when, uh, when we talk about ALS. And he, uh, he died within two years from diagnosis. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, the, the statistics about um, kind of, you know, the, the rates of the, the length of the disease are still the same to this day, although there is a lot of research that, uh, that is being done to try to change the statistics. Now, uh, when people get diagnosed, uh, obviously there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to support their function, quality of life, and extend survival, even if we don't have a, a complete cure. Uh, and it's because uh, of the fact that uh, intervening early leads to better outcomes that today we are emphasizing the importance of recognizing and diagnosing ALS as soon as possible. ALS begins with motor neuron degeneration and death uh, and results in loss of function. Uh, motor neuron cell death leads to muscle weakness, loss of motor function, and progressive motor deficits. So people progressively become uh, weaker and weaker uh, and, and lose motor function uh, in, uh, in every area of the body progressively. Death is usually from respiratory failure, which typically happens within three to five years after the first symptoms of the disease. So it's a rapidly progressive and fatal disease. Anyone can develop ALS at any age. I know that um, oftentimes people associate the disease uh, with, um, with people in, um, who may be in their 30s or 40s because of uh, people like Lou Gehrig or other uh, uh, sports um, celebrities or, or other people that have developed the disease at a relatively young age. However, uh, anyone can develop the ALS at either, uh, even younger ages or even uh, in the elderly uh, with a peak actually at uh, 65 years of age. ALS is um, thought of as a rare disease, but the reality is that uh, it's not so rare. Uh, the reason that we there aren't as many people uh, with ALS um, at any given time is because unfortunately, the disease again is rapidly progressing uh, and uni uniformly fatal. Uh, and so that's why uh, we have, uh, you know, many new diagnoses in the in the U.S. Uh, every year, about 5,000 new diagnoses every year, uh, and the prevalence is only about 25,000 people. Multiple mechanisms converge to cause ALS. This slide um, lists a few of the mechanisms that are known to cause motor neuron dysfunction and death. Uh, the challenge is that different mechanisms may be uh, active at any given time in different patients. And from a clinical perspective, when I see a person with ALS in my clinic, I do not know which of these mechanisms is the predominant one in that particular individual, the, the exception of uh, about 10 to 15 percent of patients that do have genetic abnormalities uh, and, and that cause the disease. However, even in those individuals, we think that there are secondary mechanisms that continue to drive um, the, the disease, uh, such as some uh, listed on the slide. So it's possible that in any individual, there may be more than one mechanism at play, uh, one that perhaps triggers the disease, others that uh, continue to drive uh, the progression of the disease, but we're unable to recognize this on, on a clinical basis. At the end, uh, whatever the mechanism uh, in, in an individual patient, the, the, the end point is the same. Uh, these mechanisms converge and ultimately lead to upper and lower motor neuron loss. This happens with time. Uh, and um, in addition to genetic abnormalities, there are other um, risk factors that have been hypothesized to cause ALS, including some environmental risk, risk factors. For example, we know that uh, serving in the military or 
or uh, um, uh, being uh, athletes in some professional sports may be uh, a risk factor for developing ALS. And so at this time, uh, because of uh, all the complexity of the pathophysiology, including genetic abnormalities, other mechanisms, perhaps environmental exposure, and also time uh, with an increasing risk as people age, uh, we think that ALS is the result of a number of factors, uh, including environmental risks and time acting on a pre-genetic uh, load. So ALS patients exhibit genetic heterogeneity. So uh, we, we know that the majority of people um, uh, do not, uh, with ALS do not carry uh, a, a Mendelian mutation that causes the disease. Only 15% do. Uh, however, there are some other genes that may be risk factors, even in the sporadic population, whether it's, um, you know, ataxin 2 or other genes. We know now that uh, even people that do not have any affected family member can actually carry a mutation. Um, so uh, as you can see in, in the figure here, uh, if you if you look at the sporadic ALS population, well, they still harbor some genetic mutations, and and certainly that's true uh, in the majority of people uh, where um, ALS is is familial, and uh, the number of genes that have been discovered over time has continued to grow. Uh, we know uh, that the first gene that was discovered uh, to cause ALS is the SOD1 gene. Unfortunately, now we have one treatment that's targeted to the SOD1 gene. That was the first treatment to be, uh, to be approved in the US for the treatment of a uh, genetically um, determined uh, ALS. Um, and, and, and then other, other genes have also been discovered since then. With C9 or 72 being the most commonly uh, observed um, mutation. And, and we continue to discover new genes. Uh, and all of this is interesting because if you think about the function of each of the genes that have been associated with ALS so far, uh, many of these genes um, uh, do very different things. So some genes are involved in neuroinflammation, other genes are involved in uh, axonal um, maintenance, other genes are involved in response to oxidative stress, other genes are involved in metabolism of RNA uh, or or in uh, protein, um, um, you know, protein, pro protein pro processing and production. So uh, many different mechanisms uh, are uh, probably at play, uh, both in sporadic and also familial ALS. And, and learning about these genes teaches us about the mechanisms that are at the play. The disease is also very diverse from a phenotypic phenotypic perspective. So there's clearly variability of disease progression. Now we measure disease progression using uh, different scales in ALS. And in particular, there's one scale called the ALS functional rating scale uh, that measures activities in different areas um, of the body. Uh, the ALS can actually affect uh, pretty much every muscle in the body. Uh, and that includes um, uh, muscles that support activities such as speaking or swallowing uh, or the muscles of the arms or the legs, and so uh, people uh, lose the ability to walk, for example, and then it, it also affects the diaphragm, and that's why we have respiratory insufficiency. So the, uh, when, you, when you see a patient, patient can actually present with very different symptoms. So for example, I could see a patient in the clinic whose first symptom is speech difficulties, and, and then the next patient I see uh, has totally normal speech but has difficulty walking, for example. Over time, the disease progresses to affect other areas, um, and so it spreads from one region to the next. 70% of patients present with disease in spinal myotomes, which means in either the arms or the legs. 25% present with bulbar onset ALS, which means that the, the first symptoms are uh, in, the, um, in the bulbar area, uh, in, in the muscles that support speech and swallowing. And 5% present with initial trunk or respiratory onset ALS. Um, here on the graph, you can see uh, a chart of the scale that I was mentioning, the ALS function rating scale that measures or quantifies uh, independence in uh, 12 activities of daily living, such as speech, speaking or swallowing. And as you can see in the graph, uh, progressively people lose points. So over time, they, they become progressively disabled. But the time course is actually uh, different from patient to patient. Some people progress fast and other people progress at a slower pace. 
So we, we, in all of this, um, you know, I already uh, presented some challenges in ALS, which is that the disease presents in a very um, heterogeneous way, both uh, phenotypically in terms of clinical presentation and also mechanistically. There's many different causes of ALS, some may be genetic, some may, may be not. So in uh, whatever the cause and whatever the presentation, Early diagnosis is the key in ALS because early signs and symptoms, uh, you know, can be recognized uh, and even if they can be variable, uh, progress uh, at a variable rate and also affect different parts of the body, um, you know, they um, when, when they come together and you see the pattern of progression over time without an alternative explanation, they should raise suspicion for ALS. So people may develop muscle weakness, for example, or muscle stiffness in different areas of the body, muscle atrophy and wasting, muscle twitches or fasciculations, and also difficulty in the vulvar regions such as slurred speech and difficulty chewing or swallowing. When, when, when these uh, symptoms are recognized and there is an early diagnosis, that's very important so that uh, people with ALS uh, are not led down the, the wrong path. And, and sometimes they actually, uh, uh, there's a, a high rate of misdiagnosis initially, and people may attribute the symptoms to other more common diagnoses, whether it's a carpal tunnel or a pinch nerve. Uh, and, and the problem with that is that uh, people living with ALS may have a delayed diagnosis and delayed times to receiving specific clinical management. So we know that we have um, a very collaborative and active clinical and research community that has developed a lot of clinical management recommendations uh, and a lot, a lot of research options as well. So we want people living with ALS to be diagnosed as early as possible so that they can receive specific clinical management at the time when we think they may be, um, uh, they may respond more because they're still earlier in the disease course. And this is a progressive neurodegenerative degenerative disease. And so you really want to intervene early when function has not been lost yet or, or only to a smaller degree so that we can give disease modifying treatments to slow down the disease so that we can provide interprofessional care such as physical therapy or speech therapy to improve function. And we can also provide assistive devices and other supportive care interventions to maximize quality of life. Altogether, there's evidence that this type of interprofessional care will lead to improved survival and better outcomes. That's why it's so important. Early diagnosis also facilitates inclusion in clinical trials or clinical research. So how do we diagnose somebody with ALS. At this time, the diagnosis of ALS is essentially still a clinical diagnosis, meaning that it's uh, it's based on history, recognition of the of the symptoms, uh, such as the ones that I described earlier, uh, and um, coupled with uh, a physical exam that allows the physician to recognize the characteristic upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction symptoms signs of ALS. Uh, laboratory tests are important, however, they're mostly used to rule out other causes uh, of, of weakness, and so we want to rule out disease mimics. So first of all, we need to perform a detailed personal history of the symptoms. We want to ask about family history, of course, because uh, about 10 to 15 percent of patients will have family history of this. We want to identify motor neuron dysfunction, both in the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. Uh, this is generally done. Um, in, in neurology clinics, uh, sometimes in general neurology clinics, and other times when there is a suspicion of ALS, people are referred to specialized ALS clinics to confirm the diagnosis. We also want to rule out potential other causes of symptoms, and I, I would say that the most commonly used uh, laboratory evaluations inclu include electromyography and nerve conduction studies. Those are tests of muscles and nerves, and we want to rule out other diseases that could explain uh, the weakness that the patient is experiencing. So for example, if, um if that's concern for a radiculopathy or carpal tunnel or an ul uh, ulnar nerve improvement, uh, nerve conduction studies and electromyography can help rule out those conditions. MRI uh, uh, is also important to rule out structural lesions, uh, for example, uh, lesions in the spine uh, or masses in the brain or, or other um, diseases of the central nervous system. Muscle biopsy is actually rarely needed, uh, something um, really reserved for very atypical cases, and that will be done to rule out myopathies. But again, normally with a good EMG, uh, that, uh, that also helps, you know, to, to rule that out. So biopsy is generally not uh, required. Genetics 
testing is actually having uh, a bigger and bigger role uh, because of, uh, as I will explain later, and uh, now we have a better recognition of genetic causes of ALS. Lumbar puncture is actually rarely indicated unless it's an atypical case. And then there are some lab tests for other diseases. Uh, for example, we want to rule out things like HIV uh, or HTLV virus, um, West Nile, but that really depends on the clinical context. So we don't advocate for massive batteries of tests. It's really more uh, depending on the specific presentation. And again, that's best addressed with a comprehensive neurological evaluation uh, and consideration also a referral to specialized ALS clinics. So it's important uh, for anyone, though, uh, whether you work in an ALS clinic or not, to be familiar with the upper motor neuron signs and the lower motor neuron signs that should raise suspicion for ALS, even in a primary care setting or in a non-neurology clinic. When these symptoms um, occur and are diffuse and they progress over time, definitely they should raise suspicion for ALS. In the cranial region, uh, dysartria or slurred speech, uh, tongue atrophy or fasciculations uh, are definitely uh, um, cardinal signs and, and they need to be evaluated. Um, in the uh, cervical and lumbosacral uh, region, uh, we will see both upper motor neuron signs such as plasticity and hyperreflexia and lower motor neuron signs such as weakness, atrophy and fasciculations. And when you see that combination of both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs in any body region, uh, that should actually um, give you pause uh, because that combination of both upper and lower motor neuron signs in one region uh, could be a clue to ALS. Uh, and again, uh, that needs to be evaluated also in the context of progression of symptoms over time. So there are some diagnostic criteria. Uh, the, the ones that are in practice uh, are two really. Uh, one is the uh, LS Coreal ALS diagnostic criteria that divide the uh, disease into sort of four categories, uh, possible, probable, or probable lab supported and definite. I would uh, want to mention that these criteria were developed mostly for research reasons uh, to categorize people in those that have essentially one region involved versus two regions versus three regions. So uh, the, name, the nomenclature is a little bit misleading uh, because one could think, well, possible, does that mean that maybe the patient does not have ALS? Well, that's not really what this means. Somebody who has clinically possible ALS still has ALS. Uh, however, that ALS is limited to one region as opposed to people who have definite ALS, they have the same signs and symptoms present in three regions so that the disease is more diffuse at diagnosis. That still implies whether it's possible, probable or definite that uh, the, the signs of upper and lower motor neuron dysfunctions are carefully evaluated, that there is progression over time and uh, the EMG or imaging studies or other pertinent studies depending on the clinical presentation are done to rule out a competing diagnosis. More recent criteria to simplify the diagnosis of ALS are the Gold Coast criteria. Those were developed uh, not only for research, but also to facilitate uh, the diagnosis in, in clinic. And essentially, the, by this criteria, uh, the diagnosis of ALS uh, can be done when there is documented progressive motor impairment uh, that uh, can be documented by history or repeated clinical assessment. And we see either upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction in at least one body region or lower motor neuron dysfunction in at least two body, body regions, uh, assuming that other investigations, as I said earlier, such as EMG imaging or, or, or selective blood tests are done as clinically appropriate to exclude other disease processes. So by essentially simplifying the criteria, uh, it is hoped that uh, people um, will receive an earlier diagnosis. As I said earlier, uh, genetic testing has uh, a growing role in ALS. Uh, this, really, this, this paradigm shift uh, occurred over the last few years, and uh, they're becoming more important, especially because now we do have one treatment to person that's been approved for the treatment of uh, SOD1-associated ALS. You may remember that SOD1 was the first gene that was discovered, and it underlies about 20% of familial cases of ALS and 2% uh, 
of all cases of ALS. And so uh, people that harbor an SOD1 gene mutation are now candidate for these targeted treatments. So that's why I think it's important to, uh, you know, um, to, to do the genetic testing to specifically um, to, to investigate the SOD1 uh, gene. Now, the ethics regarding the genetic testing of family members are actually shifting. There's more research studies and opportunities to, uh, to test families with the goal of identifying gene carriers so that they could be given treatments uh, even um, uh, before uh, sort of the very first symptoms, uh, very first signs of the disease. And there are some trials also looking at ways to prevent ALS in those um, harboring um, genetic mutations. So why all of is all of this important? Well, as I said earlier, early diagnosis facilitates the initiation of best clinical practices. These are still um, based on an interprofessional approach. They include disease-modifying medications, which will be covered in a different segment of this um, CME course, uh, as well as clinical research. But importantly, we also want to give uh, patients access to medications to treat symptoms for better quality of life. We want to refer them to appropriate therapy services, whether they are physical and occupational uh, therapy or speech and assistive technology, depending on their presentation. Uh, it's obviously important to provide nutritional support, uh, support to the muscles that um, support ventilation and respiration, um, and, uh, and obviously when clinically appropriate, referral to palliative medicine and hospice. So to conclude, the diagnosis of ALS is still based uh, on clinical uh, history and exam with support from a focus set of diagnostic tests. Um, we take some time sometimes to diagnose ALS mostly because the patients can present uh, with very different symptoms, but it's important to be aware of those symptoms so that we can facilitate earlier diagnosis. And we want to exclude other competing diagnoses, uh, but certainly we don't want to delay the diagnosis of ALS because by diagnosing people early, we can initiate that important interprofessional care that can improve function, maximize quality of life and extend survival. And we also want to give people an opportunity to engage with clinical research at a time when they are most likely to benefit uh, from, from new drugs. And so we, we hope that increased awareness, evolving clinical criteria, and, and perhaps even emerging biomarkers or genetic testing methods may enable earlier diagnosis in the near future. So with this, I, I would like to thank you. We are sharing a few references if you would like to learn more. Uh, this is definitely an active area of research, um, and, and we hope uh, you will all um, look into these references for additional information. Thank you.